So the biggest news over the weekend is that Jordan Peterson was banned from Twitter for comments that he made about Elliot Page. Now, you may not know who Jordan is, and maybe you do, but it's important to look at what took place with Jordan Peterson because I think in that whole incident, we'll find something very, very important for all of us to think about. We'll talk about that and more today on Indie Thinker. You guys, don't forget to check out our sponsor of this show today, Element Funding. If you're looking for a new home or want to refinance your home, you need to go to kevinblairteam.com today to see how they can help you. And when you do so, let them know that Indie Thinker sent you. What's going on, independent thinkers? I hope you're doing well. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It's a day of celebration. Not only has Roe v. Wade been overturned, but also we have reached 1,000 subscribers on the channel. So I want to give a special thank you to each and every one of you who made that possible. Thank you, subscribers for being a part of the show. And for those of you who have not yet subscribed, what are you waiting on? Take a moment right now to subscribe, click the little bell so the big tech oligarchs will make sure to be forced to let you know when great new content is available from IndieThinker. We're gonna be talking about the big tech oligarchs today actually because Jordan B. Peterson, one of the greatest foremost public intellectuals of our time was just banned from Twitter for comments that he made about actor slash actress Elliot slash Ellen Page. Now, I'm going to get into the story to the best of my ability here today to try to give you guys a clear understanding of what took place, but I'm also battling that whole giving you the backstory because there's a really important narrative in the midst of everything. So if you watched the show before, you know we try to bridge the gap between faith and reason by looking at some of the most important things that are going on in our day. And I think that we'll see that again today with the Jordan B. Peterson thing. So if you know who Jordan Peterson is, then you know, he, like I said before, he's one of the foremost intellectuals of our day. Um, and he just recently tweeted this out on Twitter and it got him banned. So I'm going to throw that up for you guys to see it and it says quote remember when pride was a sin and ellen page just had her breasts removed by a criminal physician end quote now the reason i think that at least initially this is really important for us to take a look at so that you'll know that this is rel relevant for you even if you've never heard of jordan peterson before but i mean come on if if you haven't what have you been doing living under a rock uh, but the the foremost intellectual of our day that also a little bit sounds like Kermit the Frog. Clean up your room. Being banned from Twitter has implications for all of us. Now, I'll get to the biggest one when we get to the end of the show today. But the first one is this, is that we need to be able to hear from public intellectuals, even the ones that we might disagree with slightly um, and who say things that may be even a little bit offensive. Here's why. So in Plato's Republic, Socrates writes of the guardians. Now, these are not Chris Pratt and his buds. This is a group of people who deserve to be, uh, let's say, for the lack of a better word, idolized in a society. These are people who deserve to be looked up to, those who deserve kind of the adulation and the praise and the fame in a society. These are people who have four basic virtues. These are the virtues of courage, of justice, of wisdom, and temperance. And these are the people that should be elevated in a society. What Socrates is actually pointing out is the fact that societies tend to uplift the people who deserve the least amount of praise. So very often, you think about actors in Hollywood and the the lifestyles they live and the, their, their just seeming inability to hold a marriage together, drunkenness, and, and all these kind of things that often we idolize the people in a society who deserve it the least. And Socrates believed that if we can uphold people who deserve that kind of adulation, it will totally impact who we are as a society. So it should not be famous people that we idolize. We should idolize a group of people called, called the guardians. These are people who possess those four virtues. Now, I'm just going to tell you in my opinion, and maybe even if you disagree with a lot of what Jordan Peterson says, maybe even you're a Christian and you, and you don't like some of the things that he says about Christianity because he's a little bit coy when it comes to being expressive about Christianity. I mean, he's famously quoted, or at least uh, just often said when asked if he's a Christian, that he... Which I don't, I don't like that question. I don't like that question. I don't like that question. So nonetheless, he certainly is one of the most important intellectuals of our day. I would say he, he has those virtues, almost all of them. He has, he has courage. Certainly the man is courageous. The things he says and the stances that he takes, he is courageous. Watch him on any 
uh, news interview that he has done in the past and watch how he stands up in the midst of backlash. You cited freedom of speech in that. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended? Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. Fantastic. All right. So does he have uh, does he have wisdom? Undeniably, even if you don't like the guy, you have to admit that this is a, a very, very intelligent man with years of teaching uh, in Canada and around the world. So, yes, he certainly has wisdom. Watch any debate that that you've ever seen the man in um, uh, and people that he has on his podcast. And then the, the other thing is that not only does he have courage and not only does he have wisdom, but he also has justice. I think he has it. I think this is the most inarguable, frankly. I know there are people who would disagree, but I think his his comprehension of justice is so good. Because even when he withstood Bill C-16, I think it was in Canada, the thing that really made him famous and got him on the map, uh, where he refused to uh, abide by this gender pronoun law in in Canada that said if you misgender somebody or you don't use the appropriate pronouns, there can be criminal action held against you. He withstood that, not from necessarily a religious standpoint, but he withstood it simply because he has a long history of understanding the violation of free speech and what it can do in a society. He has uh, studied a lot about totalitarianism. He has studied a lot about uh, communism and Marxism. And the man's wisdom and logic in those areas, I think, are undebatable. And he wanted to take that stand because not just because he had a personal gripe, but because he felt like it would be an eroding an eroding principle if uh, if taken away. And, and so it's hard to disagree with that. That freedom of speech is a foundational cornerstone of any democracy. And then the last one, temperance. This is where I am a little bit, um, I guess, a little bit uh, reserved in, in throwing that one his way, just simply because Jordan Peterson, I think to his credit, uh, can get a little hot around the collar, but none of you have dealt with the kind of scrutiny that this guy has. So I think it's hard for us to say what we would do under the same amount of pressure that uh, that he has had in the past. And so um, I would give him the title of temperate. So I go through that long dissertation just simply to say this to you guys, that temperance and courage and wisdom and justice are important. And when you take one of the foremost voices of those things from our society, it leaves a void. It leaves a chasm there that can only be filled with something that is not as good. So it's at least troubling to say the least that this happened. Now, I want to take a moment to dig into the tweet because I believe that within that is some pretty important things to look at. Like if he's going to be banned by Twitter, let's look at why he was banned in the first place. Okay, so the first thing he says is, remember when pride was a sin. I, I'm a little amused by that because for, frankly, I've heard Christians say this almost every single Pride Month as long as I can remember, right? Uh, about hijacking our rainbow from Moses and the promise of God. And uh, I, last time I remember, pride was not something that you should celebrate. Pride comes before the fall and all that kind of stuff. This is something that has been splashed all over for the past month, uh, which is almost a shame that this happened after Pride Month uh, that we're talking about this. But this was splashed all over the pages. So many Christian um, uh, Twitter accounts and social media accounts and and, and we'll probably dig into that a little bit more here in a moment. But this is something that, suffice to say, is a pretty common sentiment, especially among religious people, is that like, hey, what pride? Like, why are we celebrating pride? And why is that the word that you that you choose to to use for uh, for this thing? Uh, it seems pretty. Uh, it seems pretty ironic, to say the least, that you want to celebrate pride as a virtue when it's almost assuredly a vice, uh, much like what Christians, evangelicals, and Bible-believing people all over the world believe about homosexuality in, in general. So it seems to me the very least to say um, that that it's a, it's a mild suggestion to say pride used to be a sin 
why are we celebrating it? In fact, I think it's a pretty thoughtful and good question. Uh, is pride a virtue that our society should uphold and then celebrate? As I dug into already with Socrates, a society will be dependent upon what it celebrates. So be careful about what you celebrate. And don't think that you can be extorted so easily into celebrating something that you shouldn't celebrate because you may have to pay the consequences for that thing. But the next thing is perhaps why he got banned. Because it says, remember when? Remember when Ellen Page, and so this is something called dead naming for those of you who don't know, because he calls Ellen Page, who is an actor, excuse me, actress. See, even I get confused. Some of you guys go down in the comment section when I, when I do this, and I'm just like, listen, it is hard to keep up with. It's confusing to say the least, and it's probably one of the reasons this whole pronoun game is being, is, is taking place. But suffice to say, Ellen Page, she uh, transitioned into a man or had surgery anyway to uh to uh, cosplay uh manhood and in that she, uh, he became he became uh Elliot Page and so now the IMDb chip page has been changed uh uh she goes by that name and uh and and so we're supposed to forget the fact that for the first part of Ellen Page's career uh, she was a, a, a woman and now is asking us to call her a man. I would, I would think, uh, by the way, that the recentness of that transition would, would at least earn a little bit of grace, but not so much from the, from the Twitter mob because he said, remember when Ellen Page, and, and so he dead named her and called her by her old name, um, and then said when Ellen Page had her breast cut, cut off by a criminal physician. Now, I don't know if it's the criminal part. We'll get to that in a moment. But but suffice to say, um, Peterson spoke out about his ban and said, how am I supposed to communicate something that took place in the past if not calling her what she was called in that moment in time? Because he says, remember when Ellen Page had her breast cut off. So at that point in time, right, we're supposed to believe that she was born in the wrong biological sex and then transitioned. I mean, this is not controversial at all. This is the claim of the transgender movement, right? So he's just acknowledging a fact. Are we supposed to believe that that she was a, a man all the way back then? You see how troubling that that, that that could be and at least confusing. But nonetheless, so the context matters. He's talking about a past moment in time when Ellen Page was called Ellen Page. So he's not really dead naming her. And she was a her, right? Past, present, and future, but certainly uh, a her then at that point in time. So I, I think that's why he was probably banned. But of course, you'll never know because Twitter never tells you why. They just tell you you've been banned. Um, but he could have been banned for this last part of the things uh, of the of the tweet, and it says this: that uh, that it was a criminal act to have Ellen Page's breast removed. So uh, there's there's let's just talk about this for a moment, if we can. So there's all sorts of free will surgeries um, that we don't allow because they are inhumane. So is it possible that a surgical procedure could be a criminal act? Well, of course it could be. Is it possible that a criminal procedure could be a criminal act and that it is not criminal at the moment, but then in the future that it could be criminal? Well, quite frankly, um, morality is objective, but people like to treat it as though it is subjective. So in Nazi Germany, there were all sorts of medical procedures being done by people like Mengele and others. And, um, and it was permissible back then by the government and by medical professionals. But of course, it was evil. All I'm trying to say here is this, is that there are surgical procedures that are not criminal that should be criminalized. Now, whether you agree with Peterson or not, I would think that he might be entitled to suggest that a procedure that is this invasive does have some room to be critiqued. In fact, I want to bring up a PubMed article for you now because I saved you a little bit of gross research so that you don't have to Google search any of this stuff because trust me, not that pretty. But I want to, I want to tell you about the efficacy of some of these procedures. So according to PubMed, 
patients reported 2.6 of rectovaginal wall perforations after a vaginoplasty. And 37% of patients, we had repeated comprehensive dressings, which means they were constantly bleeding. So 37% of patients had to keep on applying dressing after dressing after dressing because full body plastic surgery isn't that kind to the body. And 15% of them required blood transfusions. That's absolute. I mean, I know 15% doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're doing an optional surgery and you're having to get a blood transfusion, that's a pretty big deal. 18% of patients presented with hematomia and 27% with early infectious complications. So when it says early infectious complications and that 27% of those who went through this surgery had those complications, we're talking about life-threatening infections that could kill you, 27%. Finally, delayed short depth neovagina accord in 27% of patients. And I thought this last one was interesting. So uh, the biggest problem with vaginoplasties is this, that some 40% of vaginoplasties end in mental stenosis, and this according to nature.com. Um, and mental stenosis is the narrowing of the urinary tract. So what that can do is it can give you a urinary tract infection or give you a kidney infection because the urinary tract has been narrowed because it's been elongated to uh, be an appendage that it was never meant to be. And by the way, some of the repercussions of that surgery are that uh, you can never get all of the urine out of your bladder that you need to, so you constantly feel like you have to go to the, to the bathroom. Now listen, guys. I, I, th this may sound like a a minor uh, problem in light of the propaganda that we've heard so often about the transgender movement, but because I sincerely care about people, I have to make mention of this. We, we are told that you can have a live daughter or a dead son. So that's the alternatives that, that we're given and never told any of the other side of the repercussions of these full body plastic surgeries that are that are taking that are taking place. Um, but, but quite frankly, the statistics about that um, are, are highly inflated. In fact, the highest level of suicidation for trans community is seven to 10 years after somebody has transitioned. And we're just not hearing any of this stuff. And so I hope that you can hear it from here and at least engage it from a thoughtful perspective. So when Jordan Peterson says, this is a criminal act, um, I, I think we have to be willing to at least remember the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, and remember that there is some harm associated with full bla body plastic surgery, and people are entitled to recognize an obvious fact in front of their face. But perhaps this is the big problem. We are told not to notice things in our society anymore, and that if we do, we are not loving. I want to dig into that in a moment, but I want to first give you an illustration of this, because... Ellen Page became uh, Elliot Page in the kind of the break of filming Umbrella Academy, which uh, which Elliot Page is a star of, and they showcase the transition, right? Because I I wondered when a, when the new season came out, what are they going to do about this? So they had to showcase the transition somehow. So here's the scene from the Umbrella Academy. Where's Luther? Who cares? Probably out for a run. Mm. Love the haircut. So uh, I uh, I talked to Marcus last night. Wait, what? You talked with the enemy by yourself? Yeah, well, somebody had to do something. Who elected you, Vanya? It's uh, Victor. Who's Victor? I am. It's who I've always been. Is that an issue for anyone? <laughs> no, I'm good with it. Yeah, me too. Cool. Now, here's some comments on this clip that I just showed you, some comments that people made, um, because I, I, I want to I bring this to a fine point here in a moment, but somebody said after watching that clip, that scene in the, in the show, 
uh, quote, even when Allison was terrifyingly pissed at Victor, she still called him Victor and not Vanya. And that's a great detail. So even though a character was mad at this character, they still called that person the same name. I'm assuming just because in the heat of emotion, you might make a mistake or maybe even, you know, find a way to strike back at that person. I don't know exactly what the comment alludes to, but needless to say, there we're supposed to believe that there would never be any slip of the tongue and calling this person by a different different name, right? Because of course that would be the most evil thing that you could possibly do to somebody because we're all expected to magically snap our fingers and um, go to believing that Ellen Page, who had a long storied career before now, is now Elliot Page. And then uh, here's another comment, quote, I'm glad they didn't make it everything they talk about. Just a heartfelt moment, less is truly more, end quote. Um, I, I'll kind of dig into that in a moment with this next quote, too, I think. Uh, another comment, uh, quote, I love that they all accept it. Take a little moment, but then go back. But you're a blank for talking to Marcus by yourself. That's a quote from the show. And then they just carry on. So in other words, they just nonchalantly pretend like it's no big deal. Um, and then uh, this final one. I adored how they gradually built up Victor's transition and had it make sense rather than it happening randomly. I'm so proud of both Victor and Elliot for, again, Victor is the character. Elliot is the is the the real actor for being brave enough to be themselves. And to those last three quotes, I just want to say this, guys, because they talk about, you know, not making a big deal about it. It's so understated and they just go on about their business. And this is what I would like to say uh, to those of you in the comments section. It's Hollywood, guys. It's a TV show. That's why they're able to so quickly see that their sister is now pretending to be a, a boy in the show and they don't think anything of it. Now, Maybe I will get in trouble for, for that word that I just said, the, the pretending word there. But, but really, I'm just genuinely, sincerely trying to make a point here is that in real life, this doesn't happen. In real life, when this kind of thing happens, people are a little bit shocked, at least, a little bit taken aback, and, they're, and they're, they're curious, and they'll ask questions. So not only are we supposed to pretend it's normal based upon what this Hollywood show presents to us, which it isn't, right? This is something that is relatively new. And I feel like I have to justify this because I know people will go down in the comments section and try to blast this. But just a little bit of research will, will let you know that it wasn't until the 1940s that uh, that same-sex attraction was actually was actually separated from transsexualism. This is not even transgenderism. You don't get to transgenderism until you get into the, about the 1960s and the 1970s with John Money when these these guys like him and, and Kinsey tried to make a distinction between gender and biological sex simply because they are Freudian and they were trying to, through the sexual revolution, undermine major tenets in society. One of them being the obvious biological nature of people by creating something called gender. Now, um, so suffice to say, if you want to talk about gender dysphoria, sure, that's been around for a long time. When you want to talk about transgenderism, no, it hasn't been along for, around for a long time. And so suffice to say, this implication that there would be no shock or that there would be no mistakes, that people would never say somebody's wrong pronoun or say the wrong name is, is just totally irrational, guys. And then more importantly, that there would be no medical complications, which of course we know there are. And that brings us back to that final point that Peterson made about a criminal physician chopping off L uh, Ellen Page's breasts. Now, probably could have said it a little bit more uh, uh, couthful, if that's a word, a little bit more decently, but let's just be honest about what is happening in front of our very eyes. And this is ultimately the, the, the conclusion I want to draw at the end of the day. If we are not able to analyze something without the censoriousness of places like Twitter, which are the digital public square for our day and age, then how are we supposed to think? Our boy Jordan Peterson said this a while back. He said that if you're going to think, you have to risk being offensive. In other words, if you're going to think about things that truly matter and are truly deep and truly make an impact, then there is a risk that we might offend somebody that doesn't think exactly like we think. But them's the, them's the cookies, man. That, that's what you have to be willing to pay in order to actually think. And we have to get over this, this 
tendency to want to try to shut conversation down if it doesn't agree with us. The reason I really bring this up, them's the cookies, them's the cookies, really? Anyway, the reason I really bring this up is that especially in my community, the Christian community, pastors and Christians are so afraid of offending people or people misunderstanding their intentions and misunderstanding their actual words that they have adopted by and large. And the seeker sensitive movement is, is this in particularly, it, it has this problem. They've adopted by and large the idea that we need to make sure that we just focus on positive things and never say anything that can ever be perceived as negative. Well, if we take our friend Jordan Peterson's quote literally, then that means we can't actually do any dramatic and important and poignant thinking if we are only going to focus on things that will never get people offended. And so I'm concerned that Twitter, by its banning of people and other places like Facebook and 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 even YouTube, that by their, their censoring of people, what they're actually doing is that they're fundamentally changing the way we relate to one another. That ultimately, if you're going to be part of the conversation, you have to do what I say and you cannot disagree with me. I can't think of many things that would be more detrimental to authentic relationships than that kind of thinking. That you have to agree with me or you cannot say anything that I, that I don't like or it will be considered harassment. In fact, if you truly love people, you will tell them the truth. But by and large, we are forgetting this in this day and age. We are adopting radical empathy, which means we just want people to know that we love them and we care about them. We're going to be a listening ear because we want to do the work and we want to be an ally. And that is not authentic love because authentic love is something that is different than, than radical empathy. It is rational compassion. And this is from Paul Bloom in his book, Against Empathy, where he says that empathy is not a healthy thing to give people because that only focuses on the emotional things that we think people need, the abstract needs, but not the concrete needs of what they actually need. We need rational compassion in order to truly provide people with the things that will help them the most. And rational compassion is just simply this, is we love people and we love them with the truth. If we get to the place where telling people the truth about things and recognizing facts are actually dispassionate and not loving, then that fundamentally changes the nature of love. And this is what I'm saying. This is why this Twitter ban is important to every single one of us and why we need to pay attention and why we need to maybe have a tolerance uh, cap for outrage but why we also need to pay attention to things that truly matter, that may be shaping our society. And whether we like it or not, social media is shaping society. I mean, it's totally abolished for the most part, the private. Now we think we have to air all of our public news and now, now our private lives are on display for everyone to see. That's just one small thing. If it, if it can do that, it might also be able to redefine what we think love is too. And that's all I'm saying is that if we redefine love to mean agreeing with people or not saying anything that could risk being offensive to other people, well, then we are going to fundamentally change love into something that it is not. I mean, at the end of the day, how many left-wing people do you know that have been banned from Twitter? So if they're the ones who are allowed to have the platforms and they're the ones who are allowed to actually talk about what relationship looks like and that you can't be a part of the relationship or part of the conversation if you say things we don't like, then what is that fundamentally going to do? I mean, it brings to mind this idea of... Uh, the story of Babel. And and maybe you're not familiar with the story, but ultimately these people wanted to build this big uh, uh, building and it would stretch all the way to heaven and reach God. And God said, no, I'm going to scatter you. And now you guys can't speak with each other because, uh, because you're doing something that is ultimately going to be destructive to you. Now, here's the problem with the digital Babel. Those people who are nowhere near like God and lean mostly left are the ones who are telling us what we can and cannot say. They're the ones who are saying, you cannot build anything, and so you got to go, you're the, you go this way, and you go this way, and, and, and they're the ones who say, who take the place of God, in other words, and say, who can communicate with each other. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a scary thought to say the least, because it is God himself who has the capacity and the ability to say who can be communicating one with another, not these big tech ol oligarchs. And it could potentially fundamentally change the way in which we view love and relationship and kindness. And again, there's only one person who deserves the right to be able to truly define what that looks like, 
And by the way, it's not the modern day mega church pastor because they are so concerned with their church size that they are so very often hiding behind what they think is thoughtfulness, but it's really cowardice because they don't want to address these issues. So at the end of the day, I'll just say this. It's getting to the point where it's almost a badge of honor to be censored and to be kicked off social media. I hate to say that because there are some people who are just pests and there are some people who may legitimately be doing things that deserve to be kicked off. But, but by and large, we're getting to the place in a society today where big tech oligarchs think they're God and are playing God and telling us who can speak to who. And therefore, with that being the case, then wearing um, then being censored truly is a, a badge of honor, especially if we're going to allow these guys to redefine what relationship looks like, to redefine what love looks like. I think we need to resist that as much as possible. Guys, it is having an effect on the way that we view relationships in America, and the, maybe more broadly than that even, but I certainly know this. There is this ever-increasing tendency towards empathy and towards bleeding hearts rather than true, authentic love. Because whether we like it or not, true, authentic love speaks the truth in love. And it's rare to find somebody who is willing to speak the truth and loves you enough to speak the truth, even if it may risk hurting your feelings. Because again, we'll never think clearly about the things that matter most and be able to steer people away from deadly and diabolical ideologies if we're not willing to think for ourselves and if we are not allowed the free discourse to do so because you have to risk being offensive to do any kind of real thinking. So if you don't want to risk being offensive, it could be that you're not really doing any deep thinking. All right, guys, it's all the time we have for today. I would love to hear what you think about Jordan Peterson's ban down below. And if you thought this video was helpful, don't forget to subscribe. And most of all, don't forget to think for yourself. Thanks so much for watching. We'll catch you next time. You can catch brand new episodes of Indie Thinker with Reed Huberman every Monday and weekly bonus episodes to keep you thinking throughout the week. But you have to subscribe and click the bell to be notified when new episodes drop. If you enjoy this content, make sure to like this video and share it with friends.